Now, Jim comes to us after years of working with Naval Intelligence prior to his career with the Department of Justice, where he worked as a prosecutor for the U.S. Attorney's Office. And during both of those tenures, he was repeatedly in situations where his awareness could protect his life and the lives of people he worked with and also of civilians. And he's here to talk to us today about applying systematized situational awareness to keeping our families safe. And thank you for being here. I am really excited to see what, we're what we talk about. Yeah. Well, I guess the first thing to get, uh, uh, you know, let's establish is what is meant by situational awareness. And, uh, you know, I think of it as conscious effort or conscious awareness uh, where you can concentrate um, on those things around us that, uh, and particularly pay attention to those things that seem abnormal. Uh, and in those situations, uh, having an understanding or a plan of how to act or what to do when things, if they turn bad, when they do turn bad. Uh, and this may sound like paranoia, but it's really not. Uh, we, as a race, have been doing this since dinosaurs were around. And either you were situa situationally aware or you were dead. And uh, the, uh, you know, we have, uh, we live in a world where there are threats. In today's world, those threats um, may not be all that apparent, but uh, you know, with recent events, we are all subject to either criminal or terrorist or uh, other situations that could cause us bodily injury or bodily you know, harm of, of great uh, of great extent. So, in our families operating in this environment, we need to be able to uh, be aware of those and have an understanding of what we can do to prevent these bad things from happening. I think it's really important what you said about how being intentional about situational awareness isn't the same thing as paranoia. That it doesn't turn you into that stereotypical tough guy from the movies who their family can't come shake them awake because he's going to go attack them. But rather by seeing the world around you because most things aren't a threat. You right. transform that kind of general anxiety most parents have about how dangerous the world can be into being able to look around a room and realize, well, this is probably safe, but I'll keep an eye out on that thing over there. It actually reduces the level of paranoia and anxiety. That's kind of ironic and counterintuitive, but that seems to be very true. Well, it's, you're exactly right. What uh, I see, and again, these are my ideas of, of uh, what I've learned about situational awareness from reading or from practice, and that is, um, when we have the ability to uh, perceive things around us and process our, our, what our senses tell us into a uh, systematic way, we can see what the baseline activity is in a particular situation, questioning, is this normal? Does this appear to be normal? And then we are on the watch for those anomalies, those things that are not normal. And that is what you pay attention to. And in addition, you know, you, you have a way to leave. You have a way to get out. Uh, I'm reminded of, uh, you were talking before we started that uh, combat training and, and martial arts, uh, I, I was uh, a martial arts teacher for a group of us where, uh, he was telling us that this is what you do when you know someone attacks you with a knife or comes up and brandishes a knife and this is this is what you do it i mean this guy was good he could you know just decimate our whole group but uh the guy the his assistant came at him with this rubber knife and and uh, he turned around and he just ran and, uh, <laughs> you know, it made a huge impression on me because, uh, yeah, it, you're, there are situations where you're not going to have the ability to turn around and run, 
but that is a plan that frankly uh, works a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've used it many times getting out of the situation before, uh, before the event happened or mm -hmm. the event that I believed was going to happen, happened. And that's especially important for parents. Yeah. And a lot of a lot of the people I know who are, you know, tough guys in one way or another, their entire paradigm changed the second they had a kid. Because walking into a situation when you're threatening not just yourself, but your ability to provide for your children, your ability to be present for your children, or even your children, you always want to steer clear and get away. Our job is to protect our kids, not to punish the evildoers anymore, as it were. And the situational awareness is, of course, the tool to do exactly that. Right. You, you know, look, I'm at an age where I can't do what I used to do. So I know that my skill sets are limited comparatively. So I'm not going to take on a 25-year-old uh, young man um, in a face-to-face -face confrontation. You know, I mean, Clint Eastwood can do it. Clint Eastwood's in a movie. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not, uh, uh, I am not going to make my plan of first I'm going to confront this guy, then I'm going to go after this guy, and uh, I'm going to try to position myself here so that if he attacks, I've got this way to move or that way to move. and Or this thing between me and him so he can't even get to me. Right. And I, you know, what I'm looking for now is how can I move my family from here to a place where they're safe, uh, yeah. safer, and um, what's going on around me? And uh, I, I see so many people in public settings who are in what we call the white zone, and I'll get into that in a second, but they're completely unaware of what's going on around them. They have no idea. So the, I, I mentioned the white uh, zone. The, there was a guy named Jeff Cooper. He was a lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps. And he early on, um, I think back in the 50s, was one of the first people to really sit down and write about situational awareness, although I don't believe he called it that. And he came up with this um, color code system to break down the stages of uh, situational awareness. And the first level is called white. And basically, that's when a person is unprepared and unready to take action. Uh, basically, you're detached from what's going on around you. Um, you uh, just imagine in today's world, looking at your smartphone, headphones in, listening to something else, um, or looking down, not being aware of who or what's going on around you. That is the white zone. And that's really a dangerous place to be when someone with uh, ill intent is uh, in your area. Um, the next color code is yellow, and that is the, this is the color code you wanna be operating in most of the time, or almost all of the time. And that is you're prepared, you're alert, and you're relaxed. Um, you have good situational awareness. Your head is moving, you're, you're becoming aware, you're allowing your senses to pick up what's going on around you. And I call, the, um, I call it being Mr. Curious. Uh, you're Mr. Curious inside. You're, you're asking who, what, where, um, when. Uh, you're assessing the situation around you and asking questions, uh, as well as trying to figure out why something is going on uh, or why it is the way it appears to be. Um, and this is the state that Mr. Cooper uh, or Colonel Cooper cautioned us to be in when we were in public or in some place where danger to our person could arise. And frankly, just list that, that list is pretty long. So uh, one of the things that I picked up in the times that I've, I've taught this in some various situations that for folks who aren't operators, as it were, condition yellow, you've most likely recognized from when you're driving in moderate traffic. Right. 
you, you, you've been driving for a long time. So you're comfortable, you're relaxed, but your head's on a swivel, you're checking movement, you're looking not just for behavior, but changes in behavior. You're looking for anomalies, like something that might be in the road or traffic slowing down, checking for those brake lights. You're not stressed out, you're not scared, you're relaxed, you can enjoy the music and the company of the people you're driving with, but you're very aware. And well, that's, that's condition yellow. I think that's right. I, I taught motorcycle safety courses a long time, and, and I know that <clears throat> those are exactly what you teach. Look at the people. Are they looking in the mirror at you? Do they see you? Do you think that they see you? Um, are they driving? Are they weaving? You know, how, how do you want to do this? And put yourself in a position that gets you away from people who are, you know, maybe not paying attention. Um, get away from the big trucks who don't have the ability to stop as quickly. Um, those are exactly the kind of factors that you ought to be assessing no matter what the scenario or the environment is. And yeah, so taking that state of awareness out of the vehicle and continuing it while you're on foot. Right. When you're in a restaurant, right. that's conditioned yellow. Right. And again, the key point that you made there is that you're relaxed. Mm -hmm. You're able to be social, um, but you are alert. You're, you, you know what's going on. And you're constantly developing plans on what if uh, something happens, what am I going to do so that when it, if it happens, and we've all been in situations on the road where, you know, something just doesn't look right. Something's uh, teetering on the back of a trailer or a ladder seems to be flopping on top of a van. You know, what is the plan? Well, the plan is to get yourself out of that situation in case that ladder comes off or that thing falls off the trailer. Um, those are the kinds of things that we're talking about in Situation Yellow. You, you, you're developing a plan, you're, you're assessing what's going on. And uh, so I'm not gonna sit at this table, I'm gonna sit at this table, it's closer to the exit. Um, you know, just small stuff like that, that will, in the event of a higher state, um, enable you to preserve your safety. And after yellow, of course, is orange, um, where you are, in fact, alerted to a probable danger and you're, you're ready to take action. Um, you know, you have focused, concentrated uh, senses on a particular thing or a particular set of things that are, uh, could instantly pose a problem. And just as important, and perhaps more importantly, is you have a plan and you can implement that plan instantly. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> continuing the uh, restaurant scenario, somebody comes in um, wearing a raincoat or, or, or some jacket that, and it's inappropriate. The, the weather isn't um, such outside that people are wearing uh, coats like that. And it's the, the fall of the coat doesn't seem appropriate. It seems that there's something underneath the jacket. Um, that is something that if I were sitting there, I would be very concerned about and my plan is I would alert the people who are with me and I would say, that guy looks suspicious. I think we ought to leave. I think we ought to go this way. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> you know, uh, that is a state of being in orange. When you've identified something that is definitely, in your opinion, you don't want to take the chances to wait it out and see what happens. Um, when it happens, so that you can take uh, steps before this happens. And then the next level is uh, black, which is panic. It's a breakdown of physical and mental performance. Um, it's too late to act, and there's no plan to follow. It's, uh, you're in a situation where you're totally at the mercy of what happens. Uh, Either the attackers uh, have complete control over you or the event, an explosion or whatever has happened and you're at the mercy of what happens, the physics of that. 
there's all some writers have inserted another color in between those orange and black and that is red and red is kind of an extension of orange which is you take action to, uh, to do something to get out and uh, or to confront or whatever it is that you think you need to do so orange is identifying a threat and coming up with a plan to deal with that threat yeah. and then red would be executing the plan yeah i i think whatever. Yeah, now Cooper, in my my understanding of things, didn't have red. He had yeah. you know white, yellow, orange, and black. But um, uh, other writers have written in red. In my view, all it is it's a very um, thin line between orange and black or orange and red, and that is. Uh, when you're in orange, you have a plan, you know you can implement this plan immediately. Uh, red is implementation of the plan. So, uh, you know, whatever that plan is, you're doing it. And um, you're foreclosing black from happening because you're taking control or you're taking action to uh, change the situation where you're not going to be harmed. Well, that makes sense. And it's, it seems like the, if we were to draw a flow chart, you know, yellow leads to orange, leads to red, where if you're in white, it's just a straight line to black. Yeah. And have, yeah. being in condition yellow allows you to do these other intermediary steps that keep you safe. Call from wireless. I'm sorry. Tyler. No worries. <laughs> this is a podcast for families and parents. <laughs> this kind of thing happens to all of us all the time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that idea that if we stay in condition white, so, then we're going to get blindsided by condition black. Where if we stay in condition yellow, we can access conditions of orange and red so that we're not helpless in the face or shocked and surprised if an attack happens. Yeah, that's precisely it. Uh, I mean, uh, imagine sitting out in a, a city, uh, sitting on the side of a building or, uh, or the yeah, uh, park, yeah, yeah. and uh, you're listening to music, you're watching something on your phone, and somebody comes up and is right there with a gun to hold you up. Um, there's nothing you can do at that point. There is no... Uh, situational awareness that is going to happen. The situational awareness is when you're aware of it, it's already black. Yeah. And that's, uh, that is the concern of uh, what Cooper was trying to uh, explain. Now, Cooper's training generally was in the context of uh, uh, people who were ca carrying weapons, concealed carry. And uh, <laughs> what you crazy. needed to do to do that That's so crazy. that you didn't yeah, wind up. Excuse me, right? one minute. Yeah, no problem. Can you use the other phone? I don't have another phone. Yeah, I, okay. Sounds yeah. good. No right. worries. We're working a bit off of Square. We have one phone. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, there's a, what, what you're saying reminds me, one of the other guests on this show is John Riddle. He was a SWAT team trainer out of Florida and he and I were speaking about situational awareness and a drill that he taught was go to the mall, sit down and think, okay, I want to steal somebody's purse and shopping bags and look for the perfect victim. Yeah. I'm going to take somebody's kid, look for the perfect victim. And you will see what condition white looks like almost instantaneously. Hmm. Look at your own kid. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I, I, who I have tried to give some um, instruction or awareness to this idea has been is constantly involved in something other than um, his uh, being aware of what's going on around him. Uh, I think the uh, the epidemic of uh, texting and driving accidents is another perfect example of of that. Exactly that. Exactly that. And. You know, uh, it's interesting. I mean, since we're talking about families, uh, well, I, I just ask people to think about 
all those times when you're on automatic, when you're just going through the routine um, and you're distracted for the most part, you're distracted. Uh, and I've got a list of things that I ask about, and that is when you're leaving home or coming home, that we all fall into this routine. Yes, we may be, um, you know, we're concerned about, our concern isn't I'm going to leave the driveway and be aware of who's around. It's I'm going to leave the driveway. I'm not going to crash into my neighbor and I'm going to be out of here because I'm thinking about what am I going to do when I get to work? Yeah. Uh, what's going to happen when I get to the office or when I get to, you know, where, where I work. Um, the same thing when you're coming home, uh, you get in the car and you drive. Most of your thoughts are no longer, or it could be, you've got stuff hanging out from work, but you have these thoughts about what am I going to do when I get home? You know, what am I going to make for supper? Or, uh, was I supposed to pick up the kids? You know, whatever the, the situation is, that's life that gets in the way and, and focuses. We, we change our focus onto that rather than what's going on around me. And quite often we find ourselves in driving situations where something happens and we're like, whoa, where did that guy come from? Uh, and that's because we're in this state, we're not being situationally aware of uh, the things going on around us. When we go shopping uh, and where we park, are you aware of what's going on around the space where you park? Is there anything that looks abnormal? Is there anything that looks uh, different? Uh, when you're putting things, when you go into the store and you're, do you ever look at what's going on in the store? Do things look normal? Is there anything that looks out of the ordinary? Uh, when you come back out, what's going on in the parking lot? Is there anything near my car? Um, you know, when I'm putting things in the car is when you're at a most vulnerable place. You're not looking uh, around you. Um, when you're uh, in, this, in the car and you're uh, pulling up to a stop sign or, or a stop light, uh, that is uh, a very vulnerable time because a car can be in front of you and a car can be in back of you. If you don't leave any space in between the car in front of you, uh, you can't control the space in, uh, between the car and back of you and you, but you can control what's in front of you. And you have, if you leave your enough room to get out of the lane and go around the car uh, then you, you have a plan. You have some way of, of executing something to get out of trouble. Uh, but it, it, how many of us think about that when we pull up? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's uh, a, a condition that you have to be in and continually be in uh, in order for it to really work. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a perishable skill as well. The if you do it and you only do it some of the time, um, in my practice anyway, in my case, uh, I'm not as good at it as I should be. Uh, but there are things I can do to keep those, that skill level up and um, focus my, uh, have some intention on what's going on around me, focus that on uh, what's going on around me. But I mean, you know, ATMs, or something that we use all the time. And uh, because some of us still use cash. Um, but I, I find people, at, uh, if I'm sitting in my car in back of a drive up ATM, I'm just fascinated by how little the person in front of me is generally is unaware of what's going on. I don't think they know I'm there. And I don't think they know that, you know, there's a pedestrian. 25 yards away. Um, it's a perfect place for a criminal to uh, look with the exception that there are cameras around and they're aware of those. But, uh, you know, we're all in situations to varying degrees where we are an opportunity for a criminal. And criminals um, work on a risk reward basis. Uh, so if 
the risk outweighs the reward, they're not going to do it. And they make these assessments pretty quickly. Um, and if you are aware, and in code yellow, somebody who is also situationally aware, like a criminal, is going to see that you're constantly moving, that you're doing this, that you're aware of them. And they're going to walk off because they don't want to go after, they want to go after the softest target they can. So they're not going to go after uh, somebody who is aware of what's going on. Uh, they are operating in code yellow to make their determinations. Uh, so if you're in yellow and you're, you can quickly get to orange, why should they bother? You know, uh, yeah. it's, it's too much. It's too much for them to expand. Mm -hmm. so that's well, criminals are cowards. And so if we can up the perceived risk, even as much as them knowing that you're looking at them, they're going to go bother somebody else as a general rule. Precisely. And, you know, I, um, I prosecuted, uh, you know, many, 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 many people. Um, and in, I can't say that there's a common thread through every one of them, but one of the things uh, that I quickly came to learn is that they look at, cr at what crime they were doing, if it was you know fraud or, or some violent crime even, with the exception of uh, murder, uh, rapes, those kinds of violent crimes are different, but uh, where they're trying to take advantage of someone for monetary purposes, it totally is that they are looking at trying to get the most vulnerable person they can find because they don't want to be threatened by it. They don't want to be threatened to the point where, you know, they're having to deal with law enforcement on the other end. And um, I really think that uh, most people, uh, the criminals, if, if they were in an environment where everybody's in yellow, uh, I don't think that ever any, that they would be <laughs> that active, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. or they'd have to up their game and take that risk that is now a higher risk is more significant. And most criminals that I have dealt with don't have that kind of uh, uh, courage to do that. Uh, yeah. so. When we make robbing somebody harder than getting a job, then they'll, they'll get a job. Yeah. yeah. But, and one of the ways we do that is this, uh, situational awareness, adopting the Cooper color codes. Now, when we were talking beforehand, you would also discuss another way of looking at, another way of organizing the same information called left of bang. Oh, yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, I've forgotten the guy's name, but um, he's also a Marine, uh, <laughs> Marine officer in the Mideast, I think Iraq. And, you know, um, the Marines and Army and all, all the service members there were in, situations where they were having they, they were in a a war environment but they had civilians all around them they were living among the civilians and he developed a system called left of bang uh it eventually became called that but it's a uh, uh it's another way of assessing the environment around you and um if you think left of bang means uh, if the if bang is the point on a timeline where an event happens where bullets fly, say in Iraq, uh, that's bang. On the timeline, being left of bang means that it's before those bullets fly. And so his theory is very simply: stay left of bang, and deal with the problem before bang happens. If you're right of bang, uh, bang has happened and, and one of the possibilities is, you know, the bullets hit you and you're mm -hmm. victim of, of whatever is happening. So being left of bang is where you want to be. And uh, it's a bit, left of bang is basically the place you can be with good situational awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, having executable plans, 
and uh, removing yourself from danger before it happens or thwarting danger before it happens by taking some action. Okay. So that makes good sense. And it's uh, just with the timeline and the, here's this point where the violence is imminent, where the victimization is imminent and use your awareness to stay left or hopefully shift over to a different timeline where Bang is now absent. Right, right. Outstanding. When the guy pulls the knife, you run. <laughs> yeah. You're out. Now, one of the things that uh, Left of Bang Theory talks about a lot is um, identifying anomalies. Yeah. Uh, the things, what's, what's weird, and I think all of us have this on an instinctual level when we're paying attention. Uh, one of the phrases one of my first teachers used was, behavior's not nearly as important as changes in behavior. That's right. And interestingly, this was a uh, child development class I was taking when I was getting my psychology degree. It wasn't even about violence, mm -hmm. but changes in behavior, changes in the tone, changes in the way somebody moves, changes. If you're in a, if you're in a club or a restaurant while you're traveling in Brazil, you don't know what's normal. But if half the people suddenly look in one direction, there's a very good chance you want to go in the other direction. That's right. You want to be looking for the door on the other side of the room, yeah. um, frankly, on your side of the room. I, the way I would describe anomalies is uh, watching the behavior of others, mm -hmm. watching the, uh, what is the baseline uh, normal activity in the, in the vicinity? What do, what do you normally see in this, um, mm -hmm in this place. And like you were talking about with your example earlier, it's August in Miami. Nobody's walking in the door wearing a trench coat. Right. Why is that guy wearing a trench coat? Exactly. And that's, I mean, that's a pretty big anomaly, but that's, that's yeah. what, exactly what I'm talking about. You, uh, it, these things are um, not uh, indiscernible to a normal person. We all, since we were kids, learned how to do things by observing. And we know from our own experiences how things are supposed to be, or we think that they're supposed to be. And when they're not, that's an anomaly. Uh, and that's what we're trying to figure. And then we assess that and go from yellow to maybe orange to figure out what is going on at that anomaly so that we can <clears throat> do we need to make a plan to figure out what to do? Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, scanning a room. Um, your sunglasses are great, by the way, for being able to do things without people watching your eyes go everywhere. But if you scan the first 20, 30 feet carefully in front of you uh, and from side to side, and then you move that scan out another 20 or 30 feet or 40 feet, and then you move out, you know, even further, the most difficult threats to deal with are going to be those closest to you. Uh, as they go further away, uh, then you are going to be able to um, have more time to, to deal with them or to assess them or to act uh, to get out of them. So it's important to be aware of what's going on around, immediately in front of you, so forth, as you go on. I never sit in the middle of a restaurant. I, I sit against the wall uh, because when you have uh, 360 degrees to become aware of, it's really great to be able to take out 180 of those 300 mm -hmm. degrees. And um, you can uh, spend more time and effort rather than trying to do it. Now, it, there are times, obviously, when this isn't going to happen, but my wife and I are getting to the point where we cover each other's six, and that way we know, um, you know, we trust each other to be able to uh, assess what's going on, and she assesses what's going on behind me, and I do the same for her. So uh, it's a, um, this situational awareness is something that we all have done, the anomalies that uh, he, that are discussed in, and the physiological and psychological things that we can do to uh, assess them, 
are discussed in Left of Bang, and but I think that inherently we all have some level of capability to do this because we grew up. We children were Mr. Curious, and we're just continuing that um, type of learning uh, when becoming situationally aware. Or relearning it in some cases, I think, as the habits change. Right. And you, uh, you have a number of really cool ways to practice that and inculcate into our kids. But before we move into that, you were also telling me about what you've got going on right now for you. And it sounds like a really valuable project. Could you talk to us a little bit about, about what you're up to? Yeah, my wife, who was just in here, and I, uh, she's also a uh, former Navy Judge Advocate General. And um, <clears throat> we represent uh, veterans who are seeking benefits from the VA. Uh, the VA uh, benefits or, or claim system is uh, becoming more and more complicated, and it's really difficult. I mean, if uh, welfare was this difficult to get, nobody would be on welfare. Um, and so we represent uh, veterans from all over the country. and. Uh, we help them get through this bureaucratic maze to the point where then they get the benefits that they're entitled to uh, for their good service in, in the, in the uh, armed forces. And it's, uh, it's uh, unfortunate that the system is what it is, but uh, it's really a rewarding uh, thing for my wife and I do, if not extraordinarily lucrative, but, uh, we do feel good that we're doing something uh, that benefits people who really need the help. And uh, so that's essentially what we do now. It's just a two person, many law firm. This is all we do. Okay. Well, fantastic. That's good work. And if we got parents here who are struggling to get their own veterans benefits or your child is because they can be a 27 year old badass Marine, but they're still your kid who may need this kind of help. We'll have ways to contact Jim and his wife in the notes there below the, the video here. Okay. Excellent. And then um, moving on to uh, some of the ways to practice this because we're here in a state, I think most of us reside in condition white and need to make that shift of habit to residing in condition yellow and then taking, making time to be in condition white for an hour a day or so when you can, so that you can refresh and relax. Because we can't be in condition yellow all the time. But definitely making that our default position, certainly when we've left the house at the very least. Yeah. And what are some ways we can do that? Well, uh, play games. Uh, I know it's, 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 that's essentially what it is. Um, and I was taught this way in service, and, and uh, I continue to um, take these kinds of things and, and make them into a game. The first thing is, um, for example, look at a picture uh, that depicts what I look at it for 60 seconds, then look away um, and try to record as much detail, specific detail about that you saw in the picture. Um, I think you'll see that it's very difficult to come up with everything, and some of the things that you'll miss are extraordinarily significant. Uh, if you make that game a little harder, look at the picture for 60 seconds, then come back in five minutes and write down the description. Mm -hmm. Come back in 10 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever, an hour. Uh, you can do it by reading a, a small news article. Um, Read a, a short news, a paragraph of a news article. Try to recall the detail specifically in it, and then come back later time and try to regurgitate uh, as much of that specific detail as you can. Um, the other places you can do this, and the other ways that you can do this, are to, uh, you know, when you park your car in a parking lot, memorize the color, make, and models of the cars that surround your car. Maybe the two cars on the side and the two cars that are in front. Um, and then get to the point where you 
look at their license plate numbers and try to memorize those. When you come back out, can you describe those cars? Plus, can you give out the license plate numbers? License plate numbers are uh, that kind of specificity and be the, the ability to retain it even for periods of an hour or two hours is really key in situational awareness uh, because when you're looking for in anomalies and when you're looking for detail, um, what are you looking for specifically and can you recall it? That is very, very specific uh, in a situational awareness situ You know, when you're in a situation where a, uh, the orange comes up and you've got to do something, it may be very helpful to know that uh, somebody has a walking stick uh, two tables over that you can use to help deal with the problem that you're coming up with. Uh, I mean, um, that I, I'm just reaching for examples, yeah. but that's the kind of detail that you want to be able to know. Um, when you go into a restaurant, uh, you know, and you or a bar, you the first thing I do is kind of look at what the what basic floor plan is. Where are the exits? Where are the restrooms? Um, and where's the table that I want to sit at that, that I can accommodate a plan if I need to generate one. Um, but, you know, does the, does the place seem normal? Are people acting normally for this kind of environment? Um, the, you know, the, the, uh, the thing that you want to do is, is take into a situation, uh, all your awareness so that you can make good assessments on what's going to keep you safe. Um, there's a game called Kim, Kim's Game, and it comes from Rudyard Kipling's uh, novel, The Kim. And in the novel, um, th there's a game that is being played when a servant teaches Kim how to be more aware and uh, he puts objects on a table and he says look at these and then i'm gonna, and then he covers them up and he says now what was on the table hmm. and um kim is not very good at first but he becomes better and better they get more and more objects to put on the table he describes those objects and then later on he he draws where the objects were on the table so that he can leave a map of what's going on. And in the military, you have this as well. You have an ability to, you may only get 15 seconds of observation on a particular thing, but you better be able to come down and essentially sketch out what it is that you saw in pretty good detail. Um, the same thing uh, in, in, for the game is, ask your kid, uh, ask your children when you go into a restaurant to remember details about what's going on around them. What's, how many people were seated next to you? What were they wearing? What were their genders? How old were they? Or did they appear? Um, how many people were on the wait staff? How many people were behind the bar, if it's a bar? Um, you know, all kinds of little details that you can come up with. And then when you walk out, quiz each other about what you recalled. And, and I love how you're involving the kids, uh, oh, making it a game, make it even a competition. Exactly. Where make it fun. Yeah. Well, any game with my son is, is a competition. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you you're doing yourself a favor, you're, you're sharpening your own, but you're also doing something that um, could be very valuable for your son or daughter. Um, yeah. And you're doing it in a way that isn't going to make them um, concerned about their safety. Uh, you know, they don't want to walk into a bad place, but uh, if you're doing it in a way of a game, um, you're making them, you're helping them get that situational awareness and um, it's not in a threatening environment or done in a threatening way. Yeah. So 
anyway, I, I think the, uh, uh, you know, there, we, we see these uh, games um, around us, and if we, if we do them, uh, I, I really do believe that it helps do the, uh, bring your capability up. And you brought up another point that I'd, I'd just like to think, talk about before I forget it. And that is, um, you do have to unplug at some point. I mean, this can be very, uh, you know, focused concentration, focused awareness is uh, very tiring. Well, getting back to the that connection between driving and condition yellow, you're always surprised how wiped out you are after a long road trip, despite the fact that you've only been sitting down. Yeah, it's exhausting. Yeah, and yeah. honestly, this takes training, uh, mm -hmm. not only for the development of of uh, the senses and the anal analytical. Uh, <clears throat> techniques that you can use to uh, figure out what's going on around you. But uh, that's, uh, it's tiring mentally. And yeah. you get to a point where uh, you know, you've got to disengage, you've got to unplug, go into the white zone for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And in, uh, you know, sleep is certainly that state, although some of us sleep with one ear open all the time, uh, one eye open maybe. But, uh, shout out to any viewers right now who have a newborn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's incredible what little voices can do to your heart rate uh, in the middle of the night. But I think <clears throat> one of the ways I unplug is to listen to music through headphones. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, even in that situation, I will make sure that the place where I'm doing this is more or less secure. You know? mm -hmm. Nobody can just barge in and do it. And I unplug for, you know, half an hour, hour, whatever it is. And when I come out of that, um, it's almost like you've had a, you've taken a chalkboard and erased it. It's, mm -hmm. you're, you're calm again, but then condition yellow comes back on and it's a little easier. It's not as stressful. It's not as, um, in, intense for you. So uh, I think it's a good point to make is that, uh, you know, look, uh, as tough as this is, and it will be tough, especially for people uh, who are just now becoming aware of this and wanting to do more, um, you know, it, it's tiring. It's tiring. Now, in terms of the neighborhood, we haven't really talked about that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, there's, uh, oh gosh, the, uh, uh, justice department and the national association of sheriffs or something like that, um, came out in the mid, I think around 2015, 2016, uh, with a neighborhood watch manual and hmm. you know, there's a lot of it that's to do with how to organize one and how to make a phone tree and all this other stuff. Um, and then you have little forms of, that you fill out when you're observing something so that you can give information to the 911 operator. Um, but basically it's the same thing that we've been talking about. It's, is there something uh, in the neighborhood uh, that is an anomaly? Is this an unusual vehicle? that pulled into the cul-de-sac where you live, or that's in the parking lot of the apartment complex where you live. Is this something that is, a, um, you know, is, is it a lawn maintenance person or a painter or, you know, some service provider? Does that raise your concern? Well, you know, it depends on a whole lot of factors, whether it would or not. Um, <clears throat> we have read about, you know, moving, vans in the neighborhood and removing an entire household worth of uh, furniture and other uh, valuables. And it was a total scam. They hmm. broke in and moved the place out. Um, so 
the awareness is based on your understanding of what's going on, what's normal around the neighborhood. Uh, the, the key thing, though, that I think they talk about is um, understand that if you do contact law enforcement, law, that law enforcement officer, um, he or she is going to be Mr. or Ms. Curious. They are going to ask for the specific detail that they need in order to uh, do their job. And if we're not situationally aware, we're probably not going to be able to answer questions like, well, what was the vehicle make and model? What was the license plate number? Uh, what was the person driving? What did he look like? Or what did she look like? Uh, were they carrying anything with them? How were they dressed? Uh, how tall were they? How were they heavy, slight, whatever? Uh, were there more than one? Uh, these are the kind of details that we all need to be aware of. And if you're in condition yellow, you will be aware of. If you're in condition white, it's just some car you may or may not recognize and you move on with your day. You're completely unaware of, what's, of why it's there or what, who brought it. So uh, the things around our house don't always have to deal with um, other individuals. I mean, in my neighborhood, coyotes come down quite often. And coyotes have taken out cats and small dogs. And, you know, it's an unfortunate uh, situation for whomever owned the, uh, or, or whoever the pet lived with. But I, uh, I want to emphasize that the situational awareness, although we are generally, uh, the, what poses the most danger to us are other humans. That's where we kind of focus. But uh, there are other things that are out there that could definitely do it. And situational awareness, uh, you know, uh, there's a storm coming. You've got a tree over your house. Um, maybe it's a little late to uh, execute that plan. But, you know, that's the kind of things, those are the kind of things that, that uh, could pose a danger and, harm, and cause harm. And I think um, coming full circle with that, most people are aware of the threats in a very general sense. Yeah. Uh, a lot of folks that that life of quiet desperation that we've read about that threat, that anxiety, that paranoia is there as a stressor on parents pretty much all the time. And that by embracing and becoming intentional about situational awareness, you don't become paranoid. You instead release some of that paranoia by being able to identify when you should be worried and what you're going to do about it. Yeah. And I th that's, I think, a huge benefit for parents. You answer, everybody. you answer Mr. Curious's questions. Yeah. Who, what, when, where, why? Um, and I, you know, when you know the answers, when you, those data points come in, you're able to make a rational decision. You're able to make a rational assessment of what's going on. Yeah. If the points come in and, and something doesn't seem right, then you know to take steps to do either figure out what's going on exactly or, uh, you know, uh, get your child out of the uh, front yard and, and deal with whatever. Um, you know, they, you, it, it's a hackneyed saying but you can't be too careful when children are around yeah and uh i think that you know i'm not advocating that we assess everything as a potential threat mm. but you should assess everything and determine whether it's a threat yeah no i absolutely agree jim i want to say it's been a real treat to have you today man this is Great. I've been looking forward to this interview for a long time, and I'm glad we got it together. The depth of information you have and the experience you have applying it, has, you, know, you can tell it's a, that it's there, you can tell it's important, and I really, I'm really glad and really appreciate you coming on the show today to share this hard-earned information with parents. Yeah, no, yeah. my pleasure. I, pleasure. Yeah. Outstanding. So again, folks, if you want to know more about what Jim does, we'll have notes there in the 
well, in the notes down <laughs> below the video. And tune in next time for another, well, maybe not exciting, but certainly informative episode. Thank you, Jim, once again. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you for watching our show today. I hope you found something useful. If you have any questions about what you saw, please do leave them in the comments below. Myself, our guest, or our community will do our best to get those answers for you. If we don't know them ourselves, we will go find someone who knows them. If you loved us, please do hit the like button and the subscribe button. They make a bigger difference than you're thinking right now. And of course, go ahead and click on some of those videos YouTube is suggesting to you right now. We have a lot of stuff that we've worked hard on and are proud of and hope that you'll enjoy them too. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.